All right, hello again. We're going to discuss section 12.4 through 12.5, which involves the integrated rate law, and then we'll do a quick summary. All right, so let's review real quick. We talked about differential rate law last time, which is how rate depends on concentration. Now we're going to discuss integrated rate law, which shows how concentration depends on time. And we're going to look at reactants involving only a single reactant, and so they're going to have the form small a, which would represent the coefficient, times A, which is our concentration, produces products. And so we can write our rate as negative change in the concentration of A over constant, uh, change in time, and then our rate law as the rate constant, which is K times the concentration of A to this power being 0, 1, 2, 4, 0, first or second order. All right, so let's look at first order rate laws. Well, if we have this reaction, okay, we can determine that the rate is equal to negative change in the concentration of N2O5, divided by the change in time. And we can say that our rate law is rate constant times that concentration. Because there's an emit a 1 here, because we don't have to write 1s, we're going to say that it's first order. So now um, what that means is if the concentration of the reactant doubles, the rate of production of all the products is also going to double. Because remember, we're only looking at one reactant. Okay, So that's first order. Let's look at the integrated form of a first order rate law. We're going to instead take the natural log of the concentration that's equal to negative k times the time plus the natural log of the concentration with this little zero. This means initial. So we're looking at the initial concentration versus concentration at any point in time. Because remember, integrated looks at concentration versus time. So the general form for a first order rate law, if it's an integrated, is the natural log of the concentration of our reactant is equal to negative k times time plus the natural log of our initial concentration. So here are some important points to remember. Uh, because it's a function of time, we can find the concentration of A at any point in time. And if you take a look at our rate law, it follows the equation for a straight line, which is Y equals MX plus B. So our Y is our natural log of the concentration, our X is time, and our M value is negative K. And so this slope is negative k. And you can see it's negative, we've got a negative slope. Okay, so we can find our slope. We can also express this in terms of a ratio, taking natural log of the initial divided by the concentration at any point in time, which is equal to the rate constant times time. And we'll come back to that. Okay, so the other thing we can do with integrated rate laws is look at the half-life. Half-life is the time required for the reactant to reach half of its original concentration. And we use t to the one half to as our symbol for half-life. So uh, we can derive the general formula for half-life from the integrated rate law. So when time is equal to the half-life specifically, the concentration of A is equal to the initial divided by 2 because it's half. So if we go back to our ratio and we take A and we replace it with the initial concentration divided by 2, this becomes our new ratio and it equals the rate constant times the half-life. Well, if we do some rearranging, these values will cancel, and we get natural log of 2 is equal to k times the half-life. Well, natural log of 2 is 0.693, and if we rearrange this, we get half-life is equal to 0.693, which is the natural log of 2, divided by our rate constant. And this is the general equation for the half-life of a first-order reaction. And we will come back at the end and kind of do a summary of all these if it feels like there's a lot of equations going on. Okay, so let's look at second-order rate laws. Okay, so for a general reaction where the single reactant is second order, we know the rate law is here's our concentration of A over time, here's K, and then here's our 2, meaning it's second order. Well, the integrated second order rate law is 1 over the concentration of A is equal to K times T plus 1 over the initial concentration. Okay, so let's look at some important points for second order rate laws. Okay, again, we have Y equals MX plus B. So if we plot now 1 over A versus time, we're going to get a straight line where our slope is positive K. And this is kind of one way that we can determine second orders by plotting the information. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, it's also a function of time, so we can calculate A at any given time. And for a second order, the half-life is equal to 1 divided by K times the initial concentration. Let's look at some differences in half-life for first order versus second order. For first order, half-life depends only on K, and a constant time is required to reduce the concentration by half. So if you start out with an amount, and after 100 seconds you have half, 
After 100 more seconds, you're going to have half of your half. So it's a constant time. Second order depends on K and the initial concentration. And the constant time is not required. Each successive half-life is actually going to double. So if it takes 100 seconds to get half of your material gone, it's going to take 200 seconds to do another half. So it keeps doubling. Okay, let's look at our last rate law, which is zero order rate law. So in a zero order rate law, we've got k times a to the zero power. Well, anything to the zero power is equal to 1. Okay, so it's actually k times 1, which ends up being k. What this means is that the rate is constant. It's not going to change with concentration. And so we can write our integrated rate law as concentration of a equals negative kt plus the initial. Again, we're following y equals mx plus b. So if we look at some important points for a zero order reaction, instead of plotting natural log of a or 1 over a, we're plotting just the concentration of a versus time, and we get a negative slope. Now one thing I want you to notice is that these points are not as neatly on the line as the first and second order. I mean, this is based on experimental data. You're trying to just find the best fit line. Okay, our half-life for zero order is Concentra initial concentration of A divided by 2K. And often zero order reactions are encountered when a substance such as a metal surface or an enzyme is required in order to get the reaction to occur. So it's specific circumstance. Well, so far we've been looking at reactions where we only have one reactant. But there are going to be times where you're going to have more than one reactant. So let's look at how we would figure that out. So here we've got quite a complicated reaction. And based on experimental evidence, we're determining that the rate law is based on the concentration of the bromate ion. So we can write our rate law as K times the concentration of all our ions, and it looks like first order, first order, and second order for the hydrogen ion, so fourth order overall. So if we look at initial concentrations for each of our ions, 0 0.001 molar, 1 molar, and 1 molar, notice that these are the same and very large. This one is very small. Once we run the reaction at these concentrations, we determine that the bromate ion has decreased by a lot. But the bromide and the hydrogen ions are staying about the same. So what this means is that those initial concentrations are going to be equal to any concentration during the reaction. They're not going to change that much. They're constant. So this tells us that the rate law is pretty much dependent on only this bromate ion. This means that it is the reverse. Okay, and so since these concentrations initially are constant, we can substitute them in and say that our reverse reaction from here is equal to K times our initial concentrations. And so this tells us that the rate of K reverse times the bromate ion is first order. Now that is called a pseudo first order rate law because it is simplified. It came from a more complicated rate law. Okay, so that other one we're looking at, much more complicated. If we take the plot of natural log of bromate ion versus time, it's going to give us a straight line. That tells us that it's first order, okay, and that our slope is going to be negative k. Since we know the initial concentrations of the bromide and the hydrogen ion, we can calculate, okay, so here's our reverse, so we can calculate regular k, or the rate constant. So if... Based on our equation from before, the reverse rate constant is equal to the rate constant times the initial concentrations of bromide and hydrogen. Then we can rearrange to solve for the rate constant because we're getting this from the graph and we know these two. Okay, so in order to study the kinetics of complicated reactions, we have to observe one reactant at a time. So by making the bromide and the hydrogen ions one molar, they didn't change very much. We were able to look only at the bromate ion. And so the concentration of one reactant needs to be much smaller. That was our bromate. And that implies that the amounts of the reactants in large concentrations won't change as much. They're going to be constant. Okay, so we can just look at the one that's changing. So we use the change in concentration with time of the reactant present in the small amount to determine the rate. So that was the bromate ion in this case. Okay, so let's kind of go over a quick overview of our rate laws. Okay, we're only looking at the forward reaction. We're only looking at reactants. We talked about two types of rate laws. The differential, which where rate depends on concentration, and the integrated, where concentration depends on time. In order to find the different the order of the so in order to find rate law at all, 
we need to look at the type of data. And based on what data you have, you're going to do a differential or an integrated rate law. And from there, you can determine the other rate law. To determine the order for the differential rate law, we're using what's called the method of initial rates, which is what we talked about in section three. So we're looking at um, concentrations of different reactants, rate at time equals zero, as close to time equals zero as possible, and looking how they are affected. For the integrated rate law, we're looking at the concentration at various times, and then we're graphing them, and we're trying to find the one that produces a straight line. That'll tell you the order. If you have a reaction with several reactants, we're going to vary the concentration of only one reactant at a time, and then again graph them and look to see which graph produces a straight line. Okay, so here's kind of a summary of all the reactions. Okay, we've got uh, the differential rate law, so equal to K, K times concentration of A, or A to the second. We've got our integrated rate law, so A equals negative KT plus initial natural log equals negative KT plus natural log of initial, or 1 over A equals positive KT plus 1 over 1 over the initial concentration. So when you are trying to determine order for integrated, you need to plot the data and figure out which one is giving you a straight line. So if it's zero order, concentration of A versus T is going to give you a straight line with a negative K slope. First order, natural log of A versus T is going to give you a straight line with a negative slope. And if your reaction is second order, 1 over the concentration of A versus T will give you a straight line with a slope of positive K. For half-life, we've got concentration of A initial divided by 2K. For first order, it's that natural log of 2 divided by K. And for second order, it's 1 over K times initial concentration. Okay, so hopefully this chart kind of helps summarize things together. Um, you can get a little bit of practice in, and then we will do some examples.